The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So I want to start um, with a small puzzle, if I can get this thing to work. This is satellite um, capture of carbon monoxide plumes uh, globally. I'll let this run for a while, and I'll show you another one that's got more information but harder to read. So the, the question is, why? Why are they where they are? which requires you to first figure out where carbon monoxide comes from, which I figure most of you probably know. Quick response, where does, well, how do you get carbon monoxide in the atmosphere in quantity? Yeah. Burning hydrocarbons. Burning hydrocarbons completely, incompletely? Oh, incomplete. Incompletely. So it's incomplete combustion of hydrocarbons. So you see the red spots is where there's a lot of it. A lot of energy is burning hydrocarbons, so it's not too surprising we have this here. Let me start the other one, which is which gives you a little bit of the same. You see a lot over Asia, India, South Asia, Africa, some over Latin America. Why? How come we're seeing incomplete combustion of hydrocarbons in those areas? A lot of it, enough to make plumes detectable from space. How come? Thoughts? Yes? Uh, a lot of those are developing areas and they don't have efficient processes to burn hydrocarbons. That's right. Let me restart this thing. Uh, la, 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 la. Um, <coughs> So we're dealing with, the, we, a lot of those are developing areas. What kind of hydrocarbons do you think they're burning in quantity? And some of them, some of the, the, the ones over the plume that you occasionally see over Brazil is a fair amount of deforestation in the Amazon, just large scale burning. But what kind of hydrocarbons do you find being burned in very poor countries? Cole's one answer. What else? Wood. 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 I hear mumbles. It's very hard to grade participation when you do chorus. So just put up a hand, take a shot at it. Wood's what I was after. Um, they do burn coal, and we're going to see a fair amount of that. But this is UN data on the fraction of total energy from, quote, primary biomass which is largely wood, wood and brush and stuff like that. And you will notice how high it is in a number of poor countries. I was struck by the Cambodia number just because I was there recently, but look at Ethiopia. Almost all the energy available, and these are estimates, right? You can't measure how much they're doing in cooking fires in remote villages. But I'll, that's the dominant energy source in those two, those two very poor countries is gathering wood and burning it to cook. Most of the time, most of the energy data you will see does not have that, in part because the best you can do is estimate it. But historically, this is very important as an energy source. And it's still important in a lot of developing countries. We will come back to this. Um, that's one source of energy that humans use to supplement their own before we began using fossil fuels in quantity. What else did we use? Yeah. Water, like water power, water mill, water wheels of various kinds. Anything else? Yes. Wind, sailing ships, windmills. Anything else? David? Animals, yeah. 
And the availability of all of those things varies a lot. If you're, I'm, I'm sorry about the fly-in. I'm a little careless in setting up the animation. Um, the availability of all of those energy sources varies enormously globally. If you're in a desert, you're not gathering a lot of wood to burn. Uh, if you're in Africa, you're kind of short of domesticated animals, uh, and so on. If you look across pre-industrial economies and you ask what do their energy systems look like, they're going to differ depending on available resources, they're going to differ depending on climate, do you really need the heat, is it really important? They're going to differ level of technology, which varied a lot in pre-industrial times, when, particularly because communication was slow and erratic, and the level of organization. Right? When the Roman Empire fell, energy systems changed, organization changed. So I'm sure there are other, there are other differences. So today, what we're going to look at, and just briefly, this is a little bit like Wednesdays. This will, I think, set a record, which I hope not to break, for the number of slides. Um, but this is background and overview of the wor what the world's energy systems look like. One of the important things to think about is when you go beyond, this is the fancy slide, I thought it was fancy, that I showed you last time about national energy systems in context. If you look at the global energy system, it's more than a set of national ones. There's a global background, if you will, a social background of cultural communications, rivalry, emulation, and so forth. Greenhouse gases are a global issue. There are a set of international institutions and regimes the World Trade Organization, climate agreements, NAFTA, et cetera, et cetera, that affect the global system. There are international energy markets, international financial markets, and multinational, sorry, and transnational, multinational firms that link the global markets. So we don't have a single world energy market, and that'll become clear as we go through the course, but we do have a lot of linkages between national markets. So let me look, let's look first at what's the world look like in aggregate? What does the US look like in the world? Then we'll look at some differences. So there's what the world burns, right? You will, you will notice there really isn't any biomass up there. This is from British Petroleum, BP, excuse me, formerly known as British Petroleum. Uh, this is sort of how the standard statistics go. You've got oil, natural gas, nuclear, um, hydropower, the tiny little non-hydro renewables, and then coal on top. Um, and for the world, for the U.S., coal was very important. For the world, oil is the most important in terms of energy content. Oil's share has been declining for some time, however. You'll notice the total world consumption is growing. Oil looks pretty flat. Oil's share is declining. Oil's share is declining at the expense of natural gas. Not too surprising in the U.S. context, but the importance of coal is growing, which is a little odd if you think about it, because coal was the first of the fossil fuels that we used to any extent. And it's now, on a global basis, growing. And we'll come back to that. So in terms of the US, these are a year or two old, but they're about right. We're about 4.5% of the world's population. We produce about 15% of primary energy. We consume over 20%. 5% of the world's population, less than 5%, consuming more than 20% of the world's energy. A theme I will sound today is the whole world can't live like we do. The arithmetic doesn't work. This is the point that Tom Friedman makes in the article on the list. He makes it in more colorful fashion, but the numbers are pretty clear. And we'll come back to, we'll come back to that. This is almost illegible, but this is um, 
more than five tons of oil per uh, metric tons of oil equivalent per capita and down to less than one and a half. You see enormous variation in the, in the amount of energy consumed per capita with the US, Canada, Saudi Arabia, and a few European countries clearly in the lead, and countries where there was all that carbon monoxide, many of them, uh, very low down in terms of using commercial energy. Right, so they are, there's a lot, of, a lot of gathered wood being done in those areas, not a lot of commercial energy. R Russia's high, Norway's high, <laughs> uh, I think that's Norwegian. Uh, in any case, lots of energy, uh, lots of variation. The, if you look at energy use per capita over time, you will see as we saw last time for the US, it's pretty flat. Slightly different data source, slightly different measures, but flat for the US for a long time, considerably higher than other rich countries. Um, and down, and here's the world average per capita. Here's the US. Here's China rapidly growing toward the world average per capita. The growth of China being a very big story that I'll spend a little more time on today um, and then come back to. So if any of this stuff raises questions, by the way, raise your hand. This is a, this is a session with a fair amount of me talking, but if I have to just talk the whole way through, it'll be boring for both of us, all of us. David. Why are we like double with transgender? That's a really good question, isn't it? We're gonna need to, we're gonna want to explore that. Let me not, let me not uh, say an answer right now. But um, have you been to Europe? No. Okay, you will notice that the houses are smaller, many of the cars are smaller, the cities are denser, the railroads, the passenger railroads are better. The activity mix is different. The countries are denser. There are a whole set of reasons. Uh, it's not that we're bad people, although maybe we're bad people. But, <laughs> but there are differences in history, differences in circumstances. I'll show you how several of these, I don't think I have the UK, what several of sort of the energy structures in these countries look like. We worry about imported oil. That's all they have. So you would think they might act a little differently toward using automobiles. So there are a bunch of reasons. We'll spend some time on it. It's important to understand why countries differ if you want to change things going forward. It's important to see what history has done to get a sense of what you can do. But it, just think about how we use energy, how energy could be used differently. I mean, people in those countries live perfectly pleasant lives by our standards. They're just different. There was another hand. Yeah. I can't remember what it was in the reading on the Freedom's chapter, but um, it, it, I remember it implying that Japan, Japan's use was less than China's. Or maybe it was in the units of Americans that, that Japan had like one and China was Per dollar, per dollar of GDP, Ch uh, Japan is lower. Uh, this is per person. And China, despite its rapid increase in, in uh, wealth and income, is still a poor country on average. And certainly in 07 was. I mean, that graph goes up from 07. Anything else? Okay. This is gives you a little sense, tells you that uh, the world differs in how it uses energy. This is uh, from BP, and this is by region. So you will notice that in Asia Pacific, which will be uh, heavily China, uh, Australia, New Zealand, coal is the dominant fuel. In the Middle East, not too surprisingly, it's oil and natural gas. Um, and there are various mixtures in between. Here's North America. We use a lot of oil, we use a lot of natural gas, we, lose, we use a fair amount of coal. Um, so there are regional differences in part because with the exception of oil, well, not even with the exception of oil, transporting this stuff globally is not that easy. 
it's, get, it's easier than it used to be, but transporting coal to transport natural gas, you either build a pipeline or you liquefy it, put it in a very expensive ship and move it. So the regional differences in patterns of energy use, again, we'll come back to this, reflect in part differences in endowments and in part, difference, uh, in part transport costs. Um, okay. We asked about, David asked about how, why France and the U.S. differ uh, in energy, or European countries differ uh, from the U.S. in energy use. Let me ask a broader question. What factors determine differences in structure, not just in level, but if you try to compare two countries, what might you look at to compare differences in where they get energy and how they use it? Anybody, take a shot. Erica, you're writing very, very diligently, and I didn't even say that much. What would you look at? Um, to, to explain differences between countries in how they get and how they use energy. Well, one of the besides their available resources. Available resources, yeah, that, that, that's a gimme. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I hit, the, hit the thing too quickly. Uh, you got, can you give me another one? So government policies, which would come out of the political system, that's another one. Anything else? Mathura? Very good. <laughs> um, <laughs> I hesitated to notice. <laughs> uh, one thing would be also like transportation, like for example, if the country is landlocked or if, it's, uh, if it has access to waterways, if it has a good system that allows it to transport oil in and out of the country and various regions. That's a good point. Just the, and it's not one that's on my list. It's the geography of the country. Are you? Can you, can you get various energy sources like oil by tanker? Uh, or do you have to pipe it in uh, or, or take it in by rail? Um, another, might, another influence of geography, which is in available resources, do you have water, do you have wind? Yeah, Alex? Uh, I was gonna say development history. Development history? Yeah, so like what's happened in the past, like how um, developed is this country? Um, like. Yeah, what's their uh, previous economic history? So the previous economic history would be both, say, level of income, level of development, and you're suggesting how they got there would matter. Say a little more. Or like how fast they got there. How fast they got, they got there. there, okay. Did they, did they develop in the 19th century and put a lot of money into 19th century assets that are still going? Or did they develop recently and were able to use new technology? That's. That's a very nice, very nice point. The Chinese are building lots of power plants. Their power plants are on average more efficient than ours because they're much younger than ours, so on average. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, like population density? I guess it's population heat. density, James, yeah. okay. Uh, it would be easier per person to heat like an apartment building in, uh, I don't know, So Japan. density, yep. As opposed to a bunch of big houses spread across Texas. Which, <laughs> we always come back to Texas, don't we, really? Uh, <laughs> some of that's, some of that's um, uh, just people per square mile, and some of it reflects policy, right? How, how, how you react to sprawl when you're, when you're doing land use policy and other things. So it's a, both things matter, exactly right. Yeah, Ryan. Um, well, the sort of products that you make and the products that you consume, so like, an agrarian society would like, you know, they might use, you know, so much oil, but like somebody who's going to be manufacturing of a certain product would definitely use a lot more. Also, if you're making the product for your own country, then like the consumption's going to, you're going to make a product for your own country, so the consumption's going to be higher, so you're going to make more. So the activity mix, so you don't get a lot of, <laughs> you get less energy if the, if the country is a, a financial center like England than if it's a manufacturing center like China. Uh, when we looked at the variation in energy use across U.S. states, Wyoming was very high, and I neglected to mention last time that one of the big things that goes on in Wyoming is strip mining of coal in huge quantities using very, very large machinery. Well, and, and not a lot of people doing this, so uh, that's rather different from what goes on in Manhattan. So, yeah. 
a political and geographical relations with exporters, foreign exporters? So your, how you can get your access to the world markets, the terms on which you can access them, who's nearby, not just what do you have. Yeah. So China can get coal from Australia, for instance, uh, in, in, in ways that would be more complicated if they were farther away and Australia didn't speak to them. And actually, I was talking to somebody about getting the country of Lebanon evidently built its power plants uh, assuming uh, it would get natural gas to run them. It has to run them on oil because it can no longer get natural gas from its neighbors. And as a result, efficiency is cut in half. So these things do matter. Everson, you were? Uh, I think the, I guess for just within, if you're going to try and develop a type of energy that's going to be sustainable for your own country, you want to try to like do something that the technology in your country like is there and like, you know, there's like people who are educated enough to like develop those types of technologies. So what you're saying is you could, you could, we, we talked about policy just in general terms, but you're saying very specifically energy policy could focus on a particular technology, develop local expertise in that technology, develop a cluster of people um, who could then advance it and make it more efficient and more usable and more friendly for you uh, and more uh, uh, economical for you. Uh, I think that's a, um, that's a good list and for an economist it's a, it's a great list. Uh, I would, however, Add, add one other thing, which is culture, culture and habits. I mean, the Germans recycle relentlessly. We don't. I mean, we do, but it's nothing like recycling in Germany. It's nothing like concern for materials and packaging in Germany. It's n nothing like concern for efficiency in Japan or in Germany. The culture does matter and does affect I'd say I think I've got everything we said. Um, everything that um, people decide to do. Habits, all right? Americans are persuaded. Um, uh, we should drive. Automobiles are important. Well, that's not God-given. That's just part of the culture. Um, so those things do matter. And the one, th one of the things we've, I mentioned when I talked about pre-industrial uh, is climate in the sense of how hot and how cold. This is an old graph on heating and cooling requirements. Uh, I don't want to go into how do you measure a degree day, in part because I don't remember, but uh, it's a measure of how much you need to spend cooling and uh, how much you need to spend heating. Obviously, Russia spends a lot, has to spend a fair amount of energy heating. Bangladesh, not so much. Uh, and of course, before the advent of, of economical air conditioning, these countries did very little to deal with the weather because they couldn't. Now that you can, India in particular, uh, you do see more air conditioning and it is an important use of energy. Another way, Uh, just to do some more of these, of these comparisons, this is sort of requirements. This is a little bit of um, the influence of a couple of things. First, activity mix, and, and second, efficiency, right? This is energy intensity, basically tons of oil equivalent per dollars of GDP. It's an old graph. It hasn't changed that much. You'll notice that Kenya uses a lot of energy per dollar of GDP. Is that because Kenya's doing massive high energy manufacturing? Or is that because Kenyan technology tends to be old and inefficient? So per dollar of GDP, they end up wasting a lot of energy. Um, Japan, you will notice, uses less per dollar of GDP, and this may be what you remember, uh, than China less than the US. Japan has very expensive energy for a variety of reasons, very high prices, very dense cities, very small residences by our standards, and per dollar of GDP, even though it does a fair amount of manufacturing, uh, a lot less. The Russian story is a combination, 
Again, this is 2003. It's a combination of historically lots of heavy industry and cheap energy that led to inefficient capital stock. In, in Soviet times, they built some of the most amazingly inefficient stuff you could imagine because energy was subsidized. Any place else you worry about energy costs, they worried less. So Germany, Germany does a lot of manufacturing. It's more efficient than we are. Its energy is more expensive. So um, I, will, I will pause there to see if anything strikes you or anything you'd want to comment on. I mean, you can, you can run these data. We'll do a little bit of this later. Um, this is a bizarre graph. This shows changes over time. You may wonder why the Russian Federation jumps up right after 1990. That's, of course, because the Russian Federation didn't exist before 1990. And whoever did this graph couldn't quite do a not present. But you'll see a, you'll see a couple of things. Um, there's the US. Again, this is energy per dollar of GDP. We showed last time a decline. Look at the decline in China. Look at the decline in energy per dollar of GDP in China. This is just getting more efficient. Because GDP is rising, they're using new equipment. This is just an enormous increase in efficiency. This is not doing less manufacturing. Uh, it's just becoming more efficient. There's a general, and again, Russia, enormously inefficient, coming down over time uh, as they begin to modernize their industrial plant. The others, you know, there's a general downward trend, if you've got an eye for it, among most of these developed countries. Um, but it's slight. In, in Russia and China, that put in a lot, had a lot of inefficient heavy industry, the trend is very pronounced. But China is a very energy intensive, very energy intensive operation. One of the things, of course, that drives uh, energy structure is prices faced by people making decisions. We didn't mention prices on the earlier list because Prices don't drop out of the sky. They come from, among other things, the, uh, most of the things on the list. These are gasoline prices, 2006. Uh, the units are dollars per gallon, uh, I assume a US gallon. But you'll notice the big difference between Germany here at six, the US at two and a half at that point, China 211, and if the graph had more countries, um, I'm sure we'd see around a dollar in Venezuela, maybe a dollar and a half in Egypt. Huge range of prices for gasoline, which is traded internationally, which gets shipped around the world on large tankers. That's policy. That's mostly policy. The Europeans and the Koreans don't have oil, they tax it. The Japanese tax it. We tax it, but not so much. Mexico has a fair amount of oil. They, don't, they tax it less, and other countries actively subsidize. Actively subsidize the consumption of gasoline, Venezuela being, being the most, uh, the most uh, glaring that I'm aware of. Uh, you may ask politically, and this is the kind of question we're going to come to. How come? How come Germany makes a political decision to tax the heck out of gasoline? And Venezuela, even under the, before the Chavez regime, makes a political decision to spend tax money to subsidize gasoline? I'm not going to answer that question, but it is... It is a question, it is a social science of energy question, kind of a basic one. How do you, how does that decision get made? Here's another one. These are electricity prices. And you'll see there are two bars for each country. The darker one is household prices. And again, there's, a, there's an effect of policy. You know, prices differ, prices differ between countries that are nearby. Let's see if I can find a couple. Here's the, here's the Czech Republic and here's Germany. Um, that difference in residential prices presumably reflects policy, among other things. 
The lighter colored bar is what industry pays. Now, industry will always pay less than households, typically because it'll take power at higher voltages, there are lower costs, dot, 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 lots of reasons why the light bar is always below the dark bar. But look at how big the differences are in some countries and how small in others. Right? That's just a compare what happens in Norway, where that's got to be more than double, with what we got here, Italy, where those prices are quite close. That is, in many of these countries, most of these countries, the outcome of a political process. Electricity prices are importantly political. Many of these are government-run electricity companies. The ones that aren't in the US are at least regulated. And the outcome of the regulatory process is, as we will discuss, political. Um, so when we talk about prices, <laughs> where do prices come from? I'll just list a few here um, rather than spend, spend a while on this because I want to make sure I get through this massive collection of slides. Um, sometimes prices reflect cost differences. We have a lot of coal, other people don't. Uh, electricity is cheaper in the Midwest because there's a lot of coal and coal-fired power plants, okay. Um, that's local resources. People use oil to generate electricity. The price of electricity varies with the world price of oil. Some countries' capitals and labor are cheap. Some countries, they're expensive. We talked about some countries have efficient technology, some countries don't, and it's not just level of development not just level of development. It is, for instance, house size. How large are houses? How well insulated are they? Rich, different rich countries have different answers to that question. Uh, taxes and subsidies, that's political. And one thing we haven't mentioned is environmental policy. US, Europe, pretty tight environmental policies, lots to debate. China, not so much. Russia, not so much. Those policies affect the costs of producing and using energy. Uh, you can think of other things that affect prices, but I think those are kind of the, kind of the big ones. This is, you could do this whole session on electricity. There are lots of people who are in this world who are off grid who don't have any electricity at all, so we don't have electricity prices for them. And this isn't price, this is consumption uh, per capita. Notice the world leader is Iceland. Does anybody know why? Anybody know how, how electricity is produced in Iceland? Yeah. It's, it's uh, geothermal, they use, uh, they use uh, <laughs> geothermal heat. It's really cheap, really cheap, and that's a local resource. Uh, Norway, does anybody know what the, what the dominant method for producing electricity in Norway is? Yeah. Uh, hydroelectricity. Hydroelectricity. Norway has a lot of hydropower. And again, if, you, if you're lucky in geography, um, you can have uh, cheap electricity from hydropower. You're willing to build a lot of dams. Norwegians are also environmentalists, so they do worry about the, the dams. But, and Qatar is third. What do you think they do? Or what, they, what do they have? The tiny little country in the Persian Gulf, yeah. Oil. What? Oil. Well, oil's a good guess. It's close, it's natural gas. They have literally boatloads of natural gas. They liquefy it and export it in quantity, and they use it locally to generate electricity. Back in the bad old days, they would just burn it to get rid of it. Now they spend a lot of money freezing it, liquefying it, and, se and selling it. Uh, so, again, but look at the world number. Compare how much electricity we consume with the world average. We're not among the leaders. We're pretty high, but we're not, you know, we're not the top two or three. But the world average, my heavens, my heavens, less than a quarter. 
less than a quarter. Okay, what I want to do for a little while, you may remember this picture from last time. This is one of those great um, visual displays of quantitative information from Lawrence Livermore. Lawrence Livermore, um, if you go on their website, you can find these for 2007, which is why I have 2007, for something like 100 countries. So if you're curious about what energy looks like in country X, you can find, you can find uh, a bunch of them. And I'm going to show you some, some variation. I do want to make a, a couple of points about the U.S. because it'll relate to others we will see. Um, notice most of our natural gas is domestic. Most of our coal is domestic. In fact, our exports for coal in that year exceeded our imports. Uh, we import biomass. I have no idea what that is. But um, uh, our worry about imports is oil. You'll notice for electricity, we do a lot of coal and nuclear and gas. A little bit of wind and a little bit of solar. Now, you may, you may wonder what this little yellow line is, which is solar going into residential. What is that? Solar energy used in the households, yeah. Is that where, <coughs> is that where uh, people have their own solar panels and use that to like, keep their homes, pools, et cetera, and potentially feed it back into the grid? Well, it's, pro it's probably in 2007, it's a little bit too big for that, but you're right about the rooftop, at least in part. Uh, hot water heaters, solar hot water heaters. And we actually lead the world in use of solar energy because we do a lot of swimming pools heated with solar energy. If you take that out, we're not so good. But a lot of this is heating, is solar heating of swimming pools, um, a, a critical thing. Um, OK, so let me, let me do a few. And again, raise questions if, if weird things strike you or don't strike you. Um, this is France. What do you see in the electricity side for France? Yeah. A lot of nuclear. A lot of nuclear. Uh, France made a strategic commitment to nuclear power years ago. Those plants are very expensive. They're going to last a long time. There they are. You don't turn them off. You don't turn them off right away. Um, Almost all the coal they use is imported. Almost all the natural gas is imported. Almost all the oil is imported. Nucle nuclear has energy security benefits for France, which is one reason, an important reason, for that decision. It also makes France a leader in nuclear technology. To come back to Everson's point about building a, an industry and building a critical mass, it's had that effect. France exports reactors, exports designs a decision, but also a decision based on the fact that the natural endowment of these fossil fuels is terrible. You can, you can drill a long time and you're not going to find oil. They apparently have some. I have no idea where it is, but um, not a lot of it. Okay, let's, let's look at another, another country. This is Norway. And as we saw up here, the big Unfortunately, different countries have different sized bars on everything. But you'll see the big thing in electricity is hydro, as we discussed earlier. Norway is lucky. They have a lot of natural gas, most of which they export. They have a lot of oil, most of which they export. That's a country with lots of natural endowments. They use some of the natural gas. They use some of the oil to generate electricity. And apparently, they even burn some wood. But mostly, they rely on hydropower, and they export the natural gas and the oil. Yeah? So Norway had <clears throat> really high electricity consumption. They explained that the reason is supposed to do to hydro. Cheap hydro, yep. Right. Um, but for example, Brazil also has approximately like 7 to 8% hydro, but when you looked at the electricity consumption graph, 
It was like not even listed. Is there a reason for that? Either? Uh, I don't know electricity prices in Brazil. Uh, I did look at this thing for Brazil. Brazil's running about 30% hydro, maybe something like that. It's pretty high. Uh, but, but they may also tax it, right? It, it, in a country like Brazil where a lot of poor people don't have electricity, electricity becomes, as it was in the United States, say, through the 20s, it becomes a good presume, uh, predominantly consumed by wealthier people. So it becomes something you might want to tax for political reasons. I'm just guessing. I don't know that. Um, and I don't know the cost of Brazil's fossil fuels, fossil fuel plants. They don't have coal, so I assume the fossil is mostly oil. And oil's not that cheap. Um, oil's not that cheap. Uh, to generate electricity with. So, yeah. Um, for the right hand side, for the, the uses of the uh, energy, what does the non energy box mean? Uh, chemicals mostly. Okay. Use oil. I mean, in the later US graph that I showed last time, it didn't appear. Uh, they kept it until, uh, Lawrence Livermore kept it until quite recently. And I read that since it's all, the only thing that ever goes in there is oil and natural gas. I view that as the chemical industry. They're not burning it, they're using it for petrochemicals. Yeah? Um, why do they import petroleum? Different parts of the country. You know, maybe that it's, that they've got, I would guess this is refined product. So maybe. There's a refinery in Sweden, say, that happens to be close to a major source, so it's just easier to import some from Sweden. Normally this happens, and you see it a lot of places, um, well, you see it here in electricity. For instance, they import electricity and they export electricity. That's geography. You got a line going here where demand exceeds supply. You got a line over here where supply exceeds demand. So you, and we do too. You import at one end, you export at the other. I would assume that this is refined product, that they're getting, there happens to be a convenient refinery that's willing to sell, and they're exporting mostly crude. But normally that's what this will be. Anything? Yeah. Um, do most countries have the same like breakdown of energy services and rejected energy, or is there do some kind of like? You know, I haven't looked at it. I assume they're similar because it has to do with, um, I mean, it's an efficiency. So you're going to lose a bunch up here depending on how efficient your your generation plan is, and how you do the efficiency for hydro and nuclear is kind of a just a tricky defini definitional issue. Um, Everybody's going to have more reject. I thought you'd have more rejected than, than used. I think that's what we have, isn't it? Let's take a look. There's France with more rejected than used. There's the US with more rejected than used. And there are the Norwegians, aside from the size of the blocks, the numbers say more used than rejected. Got me. You got me, yeah. Maybe that's due to the fact that like hydroelectricity is a lot more efficient as opposed to like where uh, nuclear coal like burns off a lot and like a lot of heat is lost or not transferred. That may just be how they de it may be how you define it if you you know what exactly how do you define the efficiency of a hydro plant? Um, I don't know what they what they do in terms of the efficiency. I'd have to look in transportation. You got you got more waste than used in. Industrial, the reverse, in household, hmm, in commercial. Yeah, I. If I no, if I read, I can't tell them which is going down here. I can't sort it out by by sector. Uh, uh, that's a that's a departure. Most countries use have more rejected than used. It might be the hydro. Yeah, Matthew. What would cause a country that has uh, like such a large domestic imbalance of natural gas and petroleum to develop hydro like they do? Uh, they developed the hydro earlier. So the hydro is earlier and then they, they found the natural gas and petroleum offshore later. Um, and, you know, they worked very hard at learning how to manage hydro systems. It's actually a little tricky because <laughs> it doesn't always rain and the snow doesn't always melt when you want it to. 
Uh, and they also work very hard to uh, develop hydro without wrecking the environment. Uh, so, you know, once you've got that capability and you're good at it and you've got the geography uh, you, and you discover you've got a lot of natural gas and oil offshore, it may make more sense to export that than to burn it locally. Yeah. Could you give some quick examples of energy services, which is, seems to be bigger than electricity? Oh, energy services, <laughs> driving, um, running, uh, running factories, uh, and this is mostly uh, uh, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning, but you know, electric ranges, refrigerators, running your computer, et cetera, et cetera. All the things you use it for. This is puzzling. It doesn't come from the electricity and heat. I, I would have it on the left side of that box. Well, your, com your computer doesn't use 100% of the energy in the electricity for useful work, right? There's waste heat. Mm -hmm. Your refrigerator wastes. Uh, there's waste heat that comes off the refrigerator. There's more energy services than electricity and heat. Like there's 640 versus... Five. No, well, here you're running machinery. I mean, oh, oh, I see what you're saying. I mean, here you're, you're running a car from gasoline. Here you are running machinery of various kinds. I, I don't know, I, I have to list it, but... Um, and you, you're also burning... You're also burning oil directly to heat, you're burning oil directly to heat in all these places. Um, you're not... We'll go through some other examples, but I'm not sure what you're missing. I, I guess the thing to think of is what do you use energy for, right? I used it for my electric toothbrush this morning. Uh, that's an energy service. Right? It's the energy powered that little machine. That's something that energy did. I mean, nobody, you don't want electricity. You want things that electricity runs. I care about keeping the food cold. I get no utility from the electricity that runs through the, through the refrigerator. The service is keeping the food cold. The service is the refrigeration. The energy input is the energy input. That's produced by energy and capital, right? Capital in the refrigerator, energy comes into it. We'll come back. Um, what else have I got for you? Oh, there's Germany. Um, Germany also uses a fair amount of nuclear, which it says it's going to shut down. Um, and it has shut, shut down a fair amount. It also uses coal. It also buys electricity, and will probably buy more electricity from France if it shuts those nuclear plants down fast. Germany, again, has coal, but doesn't really, it, it does have coal, but it really doesn't have natural gas, and it doesn't have any oil to speak of. Uh, there again, you'll see it's importing a ton of oil and exporting some, and this has got to be, this has got to be refined product, unless stuff just gets shipped through on a tanker somehow. Um, but... Um, Actually, that's interesting. This has got to be heat, right? You'll notice it uses this particular color for electricity, and then coming out of here is this red, this red band. In a lot of countries, much more than in the U.S., uh, power plants provide heat to nearby buildings. So it's called district heating or combined heat and power. And that has to be what this red is. This is, because it's not nuclear, uh, this has got to be heat going to nearby industry. Um, anything else weird here? Uh, not much, except you'll see solar going into commercial. Germany has big solar subsidies. And that may, be so, that may actually be solar panels on the roofs of warehouses and stores. And it may be big enough to register, even in 2007. Anything else here? Oh, and the natural gas export. Most of Germany's natural gas uh, comes from Russia. So if you want to worry about energy security, worry about energy security. Uh, and that's just transshipment of some Russian gas. 
This is Japan. Now, if you want to worry about energy security, look over on the left. Everything's imported. Nuclear power is important. Nucle nuclear plants are being shut down or are shut down. I'm not sure whether there's anything currently running at the moment. Um, you wonder why Japan is energy efficient. Suppose you're having a political debate about energy policy and you look at the left-hand side of this graph and you worry about energy security and you say, well, we can, we can build nuclear plants and develop an efficient nuclear industry, which they've done. Not clear what else you can do but be efficient in energy use. Small houses, taxes on energy to hold down consumption, and so on and so forth. So to some extent, the natural endowment and other things will drive the local policy, will drive the, uh, the energy mix. So let's leave the developed world. There's a middle income neighbor, Mexico. Mexico has oil. Mexico is a significant oil exporter. Uh, Mexico's oil production is declining. So Mexico has a, has a long-term problem. Um, but it heavily uses its oil and its natural gas to generate electricity. Uh, what else do I want to say? Oh, it, 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 all of these have electricity going into transportation. Um, and that's not electric cars in Mexico in 2007. That's railroads and mass transit. Um, so what else do we see in Mexico? Not too much. Um, anything grab you? Yeah. I noticed that like, all their solar energy is going directly to commercial and they're not that easy to use electricity. What do you think that they might be using it for on like the commercial level? Hot water would be my guess. Solar hot water is a pretty, pretty uh, mature, pretty, pretty widespread technology. I'm surprised we don't see more of it residential because uh, that's a pretty good climate for it. And electricity is not that cheap or reliable in Mexico, yeah. I've always had my, my hand raised before, but I'm just going to ask something uh, more general. Sure. I, I noticed uh, for Germany, we saw Germany and Japan, and talk about nuclear. And I just thought, given their endowments, that uh, especially for Germany, like making such a uh, hard decision about uh, closing all their nuclear, I just didn't know, like, uh, as a general comment about countries, like, why would you just, like, uh, go ahead and... Uh, but it's a huge blow to yourself because you don't have so many other resources. Like we saw Japan, now they have Fukushima, so maybe they would like uh, they're scared, so they wouldn't they want to veer away from nuclear. But given their situation, like as you said, other than being extra efficient, you you're, you're basically forced to, to go down some roads. And why would the, I'm just curious to see to see why like uh, any political process or lobbying or whatever could have happened could lead you down uh, like quite tricky road, especially with nuclear in Germany, like just shutting it down on a very small uh, time scale, if I remember correctly. And like you have to replace that with what? With natural gas in Russia and then have to depend on Russia? Like it's, it's quite. Uh, it's, it's caused quite a lot of people outside Germany to scratch their heads. But you got to remember, Germany has a very, very powerful Green Party. The environmental movement in Germany is stronger than here, stronger than a lot of places. Uh, it was a political calculation. Mrs. Merkel is not crazy, and, and she's not dumb. So to answer that question, I mean, I've read answers. I can't reproduce them because I don't know the German system that well. But that's a political calculation that um, the all it remains to be seen how quickly they do it, in fact. It remains to be seen what the public reaction is going to be when they realize how much nuclear electricity they're importing from France right next door um, and elsewhere to fill the gap. Um, they are also heavily committed to renewables and have been. They're going to spend a lot of money building offshore windmills 
which won't replace nuclear power plants because the wind doesn't always blow. Uh, but that's part of the political calculus. If you were, you know, you were a green eye shade economist and you said, well, the public over, overstates the risk. Germany doesn't have that many tidal waves. Um, these reactors are inland. We're not earthquake prone. These facilities are much safer. Um, what we really should do is, is dr take a deep breath, review our safety considerations, and go on. And reconsider how much we want to do of nuclear versus renewables going forward. But that's a, that's a green eye shade cost-benefit calculation. Uh, the political world, as we will discuss next week, is not always a green eye shade world. Uh, it's a world in which you may do things because of their impact on your political situation, on your ability to get something else done, or your ability to maintain office, or a variety of other things that have economic costs. Not irrational, but a different kind of calculation, which I hope at the end of this semester we, we all come a little closer to understanding. Uh, but that's a hard one. That one, that one in particular is hard. Uh, people gasped. Even knowledgeable people gasped. The current, or is he former, German foreign minister who came from the Green Party spoke at MIT toward the end of last semester about that. Um, and I went to the talk, and I actually went to dinner with him afterward. And it still isn't clear, <laughs> I have to say, uh, what they were thinking and why. Because I don't know German politics well enough. OK, good question. There's China. China, you'll notice, has a lot of coal. I mean. And their electricity is driven, 2007 is true, still true, driven by coal. We have a lot of coal, China has a lot of coal. They burn the coal, building power plants at a rapid rate. Um, that's the main story here, I think, that's of any interest. Um, this is India. India is not as wealthy as China. India has some coal. Oil's imported. Now you see biomass in the residential area. M much more important, oddly enough, much more important in India than in China. Um, structure of villages and so forth. But, but this is an estimate now, basically, of wood being burned to cook rather than other, other fuels being used. Um, and electricity is, again, dominated by coal, uh, most of the oil is imported, with, again, some exports which have to be refined product. Yeah? So a lot of the breakdowns that we've been looking at are all by country. Yep. Uh, but some of these countries are really big. Would it make sense, especially for like internal policy, to look at different regions, uh, especially like in India and China? I just feel like this big picture kind of like blurs things together. Well, you're right. <laughs> These are the data we have. There's, there's some work ongoing at MIT in the joint program on the science and policy of global change to, to model China regionally. And of course, you can model the US regionally. That model exists. Um, and when you do Europe, you're modeling, to some extent, bite-sized countries. But you're right. India and China are enormous. I think that the basic story that coal, coal is the big driver, that's true, right? They're putting photovoltaics in Western China, but the, the big story is coal and some offshore oil. Similarly in India, but of course, you don't have cooking fires in downtown Mumbai. So this notion that there's a lot of, a lot of biomass going into uh, residential use, that's true in aggregate. It's not true everywhere, can't be true everywhere. There are places in the deserts where there aren't that, isn't that much wind, and there are metropolitan areas where it's kind of tough to gather wind to, wood to cook, rather. So you're right. These are big countries. Um, doing this was heroic. Uh, and I've never, 
as I say, there are projects on now to disaggregate China. But data aren't that good. Data aren't that good. Yeah. Um, I noticed that like almost all the electricity and heat that India generates goes to just rejected energy. Is that just because they're using like inefficient, outdated generators or? That would be my guess, yeah. Yeah, I hadn't noticed that, but you're right. As compared to, let's see, yeah, just, just by eye, the relative size of the uh, useful and the wasted are different in uh, uh, China where the plants are newer than in India. Yeah, I think that's right. The yeah. uh, state of the electricity grid. Yeah, that's true too. The Chinese, the Chinese grid is much more modern. China has a lot of very high voltage lines that are quite new. They, their losses are less. It's also often you measure rejected as the difference between stuff, that gets pay, stuff that's generated and stuff that gets paid for. So a lot of these countries have huge numbers for losses, and a lot of that's theft. I don't know if that's true here, but I know it's true in some places. OK, there's India. Uh, just for humor, here's Saudi Arabia. <laughs> they, they use oil and gas for everything, don't bother with anything else. And they appear to import wood for fires. I don't know what that's about. But you notice all the biomass is imported, and it's all residential. And I assume that's fires for show. I don't know what that is. Um, and there's a poor country. And poor countries tend to look like that. Um, a lot of biomass, all the oils imported, all the coals imported, little snippets of other things. And then, just to, just to really get there, there's Cambodia. Some hydro, I don't know where it is. Well, I do know where it is, not much of it. Uh, domestic biomass used in, the re used in residences, all the oils imported, uh, used, to, used to power motorbikes. Yeah. Would you know why biomass is, like it always shows it on the left side of the box, as, even if it's only domestic, but it doesn't do that for wind, nuclear, hydro, or solar, or GLC? Well, here there isn't any. The hydro is always, uh, hydro is domestic. If you import electricity as they do, it shows up here. Right, right. It, but biomass always comes up on the left side of the box, even though it's still domestic, whereas like solar and hydro doesn't. I'm not sure. There is some, I'm not sure what you mean. There's. The source of biomass is domestic as well as solar or geothermal or... I think solar and geothermal are sort of by definition domestic since these are used except for solar for hot water and so forth. These are used for electricity and they're domestic. You don't import sun. You import electricity. So I don't know how this is powered, but you import electricity. You, you don't import... I mean, if you had a, a line to a nuclear plant across the border, you might count it. But electricity is electricity. Um, OK. So I want to close with a little bit of data on rich countries and poor countries. Uh, and this is something you should see. You will see data uh, lots of places in some of the assignments that relate to the OECD. This is just for your background. This is who the OECD is. It's, a, it's basically a rich countries club, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, with a few not quite so rich countries that have entered recently under US and other sponsorship. So we pulled in Mexico and Chile. Chile. Um, we probably pulled in Korea as well. Korea is getting to be a rich country. It began, it was Japan, Western Europe, and North America. But you see, it's a, just under 18% of the world population and almost half of the world's energy use. You don't go too far wrong thinking of this as the rich countries club. So I want to do a little rich and poor here going forward in aggregate, not country by country. Um, this is where, this is energy use. This is from EI, the EIA assignment. This is energy use actual, the first three bars, and projected, but this is a pretty standard projection. The growth is expected to come outside the OECD. 17.5% rich country population of the world, half the energy use. You see by the time you get to 2030, 2035, it's well under half, energy, half the energy use. Some growth in rich countries, most of the growth outside. 
Um, if you do the numbers, this is one of those, suppose the world had actual OECD energy per capita, all else equal, that would increase world use, this is just doing percentages, this would increase world consumption by a factor of almost three. If the whole world had US energy per capita, it would increase world consumption by a factor of four. That, no growth, just take a snapshot of 2009. Those are scary numbers. And of course there will be growth. Um, this is, um, where is it gonna happen? And you'll see the projection, and again, up to 2008, the actual, and we're getting close to 2015, is non-OECD Asia. What is non-OECD Asia? Non-OECD Asia is mainly India and China, and Indonesia, for that matter, but it's mainly India and China. So here's coal consumption. Recall I said the coal market share has been growing. Where is that coming from? Non-OECD Asia, India and China. You will recall India and China have a lot of coal. India and China, as they move toward, move out of poverty, are burning it. Not unreasonable at one level, but that's how you get CO2 emissions growth. This is world energy-related CO2 emissions OECD, non-OECD. What's the growth? The growth is non-OECD Asia burning coal, largely, largely. So again, if you run these kinds of numbers, suppose the world got to where the OECD is, or suppose the world got to where the US is, forget growth, after that, you'd have CO2 emissions up by a multiple. That's, as we will discuss when we talk about climate, we'll talk about climate a little bit next time and more later, that's scary. You're gonna double CO2 emissions, that's scary. But if I'm a poor country, I say, wait a minute. You guys burned your coal. You're using much more energy than we are per capita. You got rich. Don't we get a chance to get rich? You guys sit in fancy classrooms at MIT and try hard to stay awake and all of that. Uh, don't we get to do that? So uh, we'll come back to this because I think this is kind of one of the great issues of the day. Um, I'm gonna close with some final thoughts. I hope you got that there's a lot of diversity. Some of it comes from resources but some of it comes from culture and some of it comes from politics and some of it comes from a variety of technology, efficiency, history, a variety of reasons. The last point, which will be a very important point going forward, which is we expect the growth to come in the future, absent anything else, from the developing world. If the rest of the world gets rich the way we got rich, there will be enormous increases in energy use which may not be feasible, and in CO2 emissions, which at least your children and grandchildren will not like much. I know that's an impossible thought, but uh, you will have children and grandchildren. Um, and this is something we'll be talking about. That's hard. We know how we got rich. We burned fossil fuels. And we use that to acquire capital stock and knowledge and build universities and do all those great things. But that won't work. That won't work. Um, what will work? You got me, that's what you guys are for. Okay, any questions or comments? Reactions, thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, you said something last class. Um, most of the US yeah. So that's, that's, just right. that's true, right? Um, are you, you explain that more when you go along? Or? Yeah. Which part would you like explained? Okay, we'll talk about that when we go sector by sector, but an awful lot of the 
infrastructure is in regulated areas. So part of the reason you could raise private capital was the capital wasn't hugely at risk. So for electric power, for instance, if you build a power plant, the regulator says, yeah, go ahead, you would get a return on your investment. That makes it easier. We'll come back to that, okay? Okay, thank you.